Welcome to Music History Monday for May 8th, 2023. I'm Bob Greenberg, and the title for today's podcast is Louis Moreau Gottschalk, or What Happens in Oakland Does Not Stay in Oakland. If you haven't already, please consider joining me on my subscription site at patreon.com slash Robert Greenberg Music where I blog, vlog, podcast, pontificate, review, and bloviate four to six times a week. We mark the birth on May 8, 1829, 194 years ago today, of the American composer and pianist Louis Moreau Gottschalk in New Orleans. He died all too young on December 18, 1869, at the age of 40 in exile in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Events that occurred in September of 1865 in San Francisco, California, and across the San Francisco Bay in Oakland led directly to Gottschalk's exile to South America. Those frankly tawdry events, most unfairly, have been recounted way too often and as a result, they have come to obscure Gottschalk's memory as a composer, pianist, patriot, and philanthropist. That's because people like me continue to write about them as if they somehow encapsulated the totality of who and what Louis Moreau Gottschalk was. I hate myself for having participated in this unholy example of scandal-mongering. I do. And I stand before you filled with shame and remorse. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I fully intend to rehash these, these salacious events here and now with the understanding that following that rehash, we will spend the remainder of this post and all of tomorrow's Dr. Bob Prescribes post doing penance by providing a proper account of the cultural importance of Gottschalk's hometown of New Orleans, as well as his life, times, and musical career. Background. During his lifetime, Louis Moreau Gottschalk was considered to be the greatest pianist and composer ever born in the Western Hemisphere, the Chopin of the New World. An American patriot, he forswore his allegiance to his native South and embraced the Northern cause during the Civil War because of his unreserved hatred of slavery. During the Civil War, he traveled and concertized tirelessly across the North and Midwest of the United States, inspiring his audiences with compositions and arrangements of patriotic melodies. He gave away much of his earnings to veterans' organizations. He was born in 1829 in what was then the most highly cultured and diverse city in the United States, New Orleans. Gottschalk's personal heritage was diverse as well. His father was a Jewish businessman from London and his mother a Creole, that is, a Louisiana native of French descent. He was a musical prodigy whose compositions synthesized the incredibly different sorts of music he heard around him in New Orleans. African music, Caribbean music, Creole music, as well as the classics of the European concert tradition. Trained at the Paris Conservatoire, the 20-year-old Gottschalk was called Chopin's successor when Chopin died in 1849. Subsequent concert tours took him across Europe, North America, Central America, and South America, and they made him a legend in his time. Gottschalk's American fame reached its apogee in the months following the end of the Civil War during the late spring and summer of 1865. His subsequent fall from public grace and exile in September of 1865 was that much more extraordinary for the height 
from which he fell. Hello, San Francisco. On April 27, 1865, 18 days after Robert E. Lee's surrender at Appomattox, Louis Moreau Gottschalk arrived in San Francisco for what was to be a five-month California tour. Within days, the preeminent San Francisco paper of the time, the Daily Alta California, which included among its staff the 30-year-old Samuel Clemens, later be known as Mark Twain, declared Gottschalk to be, and we quote, the world's best pianist and composer, unquote. Gottschalk was inundated with invitations to perform, including one from the Oakland Female Seminary across the bay in Oakland. The seminary was an ultra-strict theological college that banned dancing and parties and forbade its young ladies from leaving the school unless accompanied by a parent or guardian. Gottschalk performed at the seminary on May 18, 1865, after which he gave the place not another thought. Ah, but the young ladies at the seminary thought a lot about Louis Moreau Gottschalk. He was an international celebrity and a great showman. He was also cute, and at 36 he wasn't too, too old. The young ladies didn't get to see his like very often there in Oak Town. The sequence of events that were to rock Gottschalk's world began on September 14th, four months after the concert at the Oakland Female Seminary. Here's what happened. Gottschalk had a friend in San Francisco, a dude named Charles Legay. Regarding that name, please, no sophomoric comments. This Charles Legay had been receiving anonymous love letters from someone claiming to be a 20-year-old woman. On September 14, 1865, Legay received a letter from this young lady inviting him for a rendezvous in Oakland and suggested that he bring his friend Gottschalk along with him. Cool, thought Gottschalk and Legay, who ferried across San Francisco Bay and then took a carriage to the appointed place. Eventually, two very young women did indeed show up. Neither of them was even close to being 20 years old, but Gottschalk and Legay did not card them and thus could claim ignorance on that count. The girls got into the carriage with the men, and that's the last we know until they were dropped off early the next morning at 528 11th Street between Washington and Clay, about four miles from where I am recording this, in what today is downtown Oakland. Degrees in rocket science are not required to divine that 528 11th Street, between Washington and Clay, was the address of the Oakland Seminary for Young Ladies, where both of the underaged girls were students. It took less than a day for the merd to hit the fan, the Sacramento Daily Bee reported, quote, a bit of scandalous behavior on the part of Gottschalk, unquote, and claimed that the girls did not return to school until after daybreak, at which time they were both summarily expelled. The San Francisco Examiner then swung into action, quote, we spare our readers a detailed account of the infamous affair. It is sufficient to say that two young and blooming girls have been forever ruined by two heartless libertines, and that one of the girls has been sent off to a convent. The simple-minded girls were dazzled by a flashing exterior in a celebrated manner and fell victim to the hellish lust of the seducers." Unquote. The San Francisco Daily Morning Call picked things up from there. Quote, it's the same old story. 
A strolling adventurer captivates the fancy of thoughtless young girls who, closing their eyes to the terrible future into which they, by their one criminal act, plunge themselves, give themselves to the embraces of the seducer." Unquote. The Daily Grammatic Chronicle began its coverage with the headline, quote, L. M. Gottschalk, Tar and Feather, unquote. Tar and Feather? L. M. Gottschalk didn't have to read much more than that. In the space of just three days, he'd gone from being the toast of San Francisco to being just toast. On September 18, 1865, wearing a disguise and identifying himself as Mr. John Smith, he slipped aboard the Panama-bound steamship Colorado just minutes before its 2 p.m. departure. Gottschalk had learned it the hard way. What you do in Oakland does not necessarily stay in Oakland. A living, breathing Louis Moreau Gottschalk never set foot in the United States again. He died in Rio de Janeiro four years after his escape from San Francisco. It was only then that he was allowed to return to the U.S., where he was buried and rests today in the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, New York. With that remarkable story out of the way, we can now turn our attention to placing Gottschalk firmly within his time and place. We begin with a question. What constitutes American culture? And please, no U.S. bashing by suggesting that the phrase American culture is an oxymoron. In fact, the cultural gifts the United States has given the world are quite wonderful, and nowhere is this more true than in the realm of music. Here's a short list of American-born musical genres that have become part of our planetary musical heritage. Spirituals, gospel, blues, rhythm and blues, soul, ragtime, jazz, rock and roll, metal, zydeco, bluegrass, country and western, Tex-Mex, rap, hip-hop, Tin Pan Alley, and the Great American Songbook. I could go on, but I needn't. Whether someone likes or dislikes any or all of these genres, the point stands. The musical gifts of the American nation to the world are incalculable. What all these genres have in common, and at the same time makes them American, is that they are syncretic, meaning that they are syntheses of diverse musical elements into wholes enormously greater than the sum of their parts. Of greatest import to American music is the synthesis of West African and European musical traditions, a synthesis that created a vast array of uniquely American musical genres, from gospel and soul to ragtime and blues, from jazz and rock and roll to hip hop and rap. So back to the question, what constitutes American culture? The answer? American culture is an amalgam, a complex blend of diverse racial, ethnic, and national elements. Music made in America that reflects and synthesizes the inherent diversity of the American experiment. As an example of that American musical diversity and synthesis, we turn to a solo piano work by Louis Moreau Gottschalk called Bambula. It was composed in 1845 when Gottschalk, again a native of New Orleans, was just 16 years old. A bambula is a drum made by stretching a skin over a large cross-section of bamboo, as well as a dance accompanied by such drums. Both drum and dance had been brought to New Orleans by enslaved West Africans. As we listen to Gottschalk's piece, a performance of which is linked to this post, 
Let's be particularly aware of two things. One, the percussive nature of much of the work, during which Gottschalk uses the piano as if it were a set of drums. Thing two, the music is syncopated, meaning that we will hear accents not just on beats, but in between beats. Fifty years later, these sorts of West African-derived syncopations would define a genre of piano music called ragtime. Bambula, as played by Alan Feinberg, is linked. This is music in which West African-inspired melodic and rhythmic elements are set to European harmonies and played on a European musical instrument, music that could only have been created in the melting pot of North America. And when it comes to the multiplicity of the melting pot, no 19th century American city was more diversified than New Orleans. Why New Orleans really matters. New Orleans was founded on May 7, 1718, and was named for Philippe II, Duke of Orléans, who lived from 1674 to 1723, a gentleman who served as regent for King Louis XV from 1715 until 1723. As a multicultural, multinational, multiracial, multiethnic, multilingual American city, New Orleans is unique. Since its founding, it has had six different national affiliations. From 1718 to 1763, it was part of the Kingdom of France. From 1763 to 1802, it was part of the Kingdom of Spain. Yeah, for our information, the great majority of the older buildings in the French Quarter date from this Spanish period. From 1802 to 1803, Napoleonic conquests made it part of the French First Republic. As part of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, New Orleans then became part of the United States of America, which it remained until 1861. In 1861, Louisiana seceded from the Union, and New Orleans became, by far, the largest city in the Confederacy. In 1862, New Orleans was captured by Union troops and has been part of the United States ever since. From the moment of its founding, New Orleans has been one of North America's most important port cities the principal port city for the Mississippi River watershed, which covers roughly 50% of the continental United States. By 1840, New Orleans was the wealthiest and the third most populous city in the United States, behind only New York City and Baltimore, Maryland. New Orleans was also the initial destination for some two-thirds of the enslaved people brought to North America. Paradoxically, by 1860, the city also had 13,000 free people of color, mixed-race people who were classified as being mulatto, which was a blanket term for anyone of mixed race. Mostly French-speaking, these free mulattoes made up the artisan, educated, and professional class of African Americans in New Orleans. The best years of its life, economically and culturally, the period between 1820 and 1861 was New Orleans' glory years, during which it stood at the very height of its wealth and strength. With a population of nearly 170,000 residents, it was more than four times the size of either Charleston, South Carolina, or Richmond, Virginia. Culturally, New Orleans was a melange of everything. European, especially French culture, Caribbean, Latin American, and African cultures and languages. 
of people of every color, of free and enslaved people, of the super rich and the desperately poor, all pressed together in the tropical heat between the waters of the Mississippi River and the brackish estuary known as Lake Pontchartrain. And it is thanks to its stunning diversity that nearly 100 years before New Orleans gave us jazz, it gave us the first great American composer. We are what we eat. Yeah, as cliches go, we are what we eat is right on the money. In particular, it's the experiential meals of our childhoods that, more than anything else, shape our proclivities and our perceptions of the world around us. As a child, Louis Moreau Gottschalk dined at the inexhaustible cultural smorgasbord that was his native New Orleans. He was born there on May 8, 1829, 194 years ago today. His father, Edward Gottschalk, was again a London-born Jewish businessman, himself born in 1795. His mother, Amy Brousselet Gottschalk, was a Catholic Creole. She was just 16 years old when Moreau, as her son was called, was born. However, the most important adults in Moreau's childhood were not his parents, but rather his maternal grandmother, Josephine Alex Brousselet, and his nurse, an enslaved woman named only Sally, who was roughly 46 years old when Moreau was born. Both his grandmother and Sally had been born in Saint-Domingue, the French colony today known as Haiti. They both survived the slave rebellion of 1793, though Moreau's grandmother's family was not so lucky. Most of the men in her family were massacred, and her aunts died after, according to Gottschalk, quote, the most horrible outrages, unquote. These two fairly elderly women, Grandmother Brousselet and Nurse Sally, were Moreau's link with his family's past. Together, they filled his ears with Creole lullabies and songs, with legends and stories of Saint-Domingue, with the lore of South Louisiana and the horrific slave revolt that they had miraculously escaped. Gottschalk remembered, quote, We would listen by the fire on the hearth, under the coals of which Sally baked her sweet potatoes, to the recital of this terrible insurrection. Sally, while listening to Grandmother Brousselet, spoke in a low voice to a portrait of Napoleon that hung above the fireplace, which she obstinately believed was bewitched. I was Sally's favorite, to judge by the stories with which she filled my head." Unquote. Yes, Gottschalk's family owned enslaved people. In fact, Moreau's father Edward made his living speculating in real estate, commodities, and enslaved people. It was a cruel and dirty business, something that was not lost on Moreau. Later in life, reflecting on the horrors his family had suffered during the slave revolt, he asked, quote, Our dwellings burned, our properties devastated, our fortunes annihilated, such were the first effects of that war between two races that had in common only that implacable hatred which each nourished for the other. But can anyone be astonished at the retaliation exercised by the Negroes on their masters? What cause could be more legitimate than that of this people rising in their agony in one grand effort to reconquer their rights and humanity?" Unquote. Writing to his sister in Paris on December 12, 1863, during the midst of the American Civil War, Gottschalk laid out his feelings about slavery loud and clear. Quote, when you find out what slavery is, when you have observed its horrors, as I have, 
when you have seen thousands die through unimaginable tortures, when your heart has bled like mine has at the sight of myriads of poor human beings, including children and old people, treated like we would not treat a dog, then you would condemn slavery without forgiveness, the greatest inequity which the age of barbarity bequeathed us." Unquote. Louis Moreau Gottschalk got it, which was why he did not, could not, stay in the South when the Civil War broke out. But there's something more here. You see, Gottschalk was fascinated by black music and culture. As a composer of genius, he did not imitate, that is, culturally appropriate, African-American music. Oh, no. He absorbed its content and spirit and made the music his own. As a white American composer working in the mid-19th century, this made him unique. When we return in Dr. Bob Prescribes tomorrow, it will be with further specifics of Gottschalk's biography and his music for the piano. Until then, thank you. To sample and download one or all of my many courses on subjects musical produced by The Great Courses slash The Teaching Company, please visit my website at robertgreenbergmusic.com.